Chapter 8, Out of the Sky The names of the B-17 crew were released on October 25th, five days after the plane vanished. The Army and the Navy were using every available plane to search for the men, but by now the papers were declaring them and their famous passenger lost for good. Only a wisp of hope, reported the Lewiston Tribune in Idaho. A star has vanished, decreed the Gatson Times in Alabama. The Wichita Beacon in Kansas left no doubt at all. Rickenbacker, death, a serious blow, read its headline on October 27th, six days after the men disappeared. Rickenbacker's close friends and relatives weren't ready to write him off just yet. They spoke to reporters or wrote letters to the editor insisting that Eddie would survive this close call, just like he had survived the others. But most reporters retold the story of Rickenbacker's life as though they were speaking at his funeral, and nearly everyone agreed that the world had lost a great American. According to the papers, Eddie was a role model. He was a hero at a time when Americans needed heroes. He stood for values that seemed especially important to a nation at war. Eddie was a man of action. No swivel chair for him but the pilot seat and the roar of the motor, wrote one reporter. Eddie believed in progress. He raced automobiles in the days when just one in 50 Americans owned one. He flew military missions at a time when planes had been around for barely more than a decade. He started a commercial airline when most people were too scared to set foot on a plane. Eddie wasn't afraid to take risks. In his racing days, a newspaper called him Leadfoot Ed because he knew only one way to race. Floor it until you either win or crash. According to an Illinois paper, he was the bravest of the brave. Now it appeared he was gone forever. Eddie had been a meteor, blazing his way across the horizon of human achievement, gushed the reporter from the Gatson Times. His star arose and dazzled during the First World War, and the shining arc of it swept into the war of the present, finally to be smothered in the spume of the restless Pacific. Back on the rafts, Rickenbacker's star was merely dozing when a small seabird, a swallow, or a tern, circled the group, came unusually low in the sky, and landed on his hat. Eddie woke. The bird looked around, the gaunt creature in front of him. They stared back. No one spoke. No one moved. Rickenbacker saw the greed in his eyes of the raft mates and knew exactly what had happened. He raised his right hand as slowly as he could bear. He touched his chin. He raised his hand higher. When it reached the brim of his hat, he made a blind grab for the bird, Cl uh, clamped his fingers around its legs, trapped its body with his other hand, and hung on as though eight lives depended on it. The bird could not have weighed more than three ounces, but it was food, and more importantly, bait. Rickenbacker wrung the bird's neck and plucked its feathers. He carved out the intestines and set them aside. Then he carefully cut the rest into eight equal pieces of dark meat. The men devoured the tiny bites, raw, bones and all. Aside from the four bites of orange they had so carefully rationed, it was the first food to cross their lips in nearly 200 hours. The mor morsels of bird meat were just enough to make their mouths water for more. Rickenbacker handed a slimy piece of seabird intestines to the other large raft. Two baited hooks went overboard, and eight pairs of eyes stared after them. It didn't take long for the dead bird to serve its purpose. Cherry's boat hauled in a fish about eight to twelve inches long. Rickenbacker caught another the same size. The men carved the first fish into portions an inch square and a half inch thick. They agreed to store the second fish for the next day's meal. Rickenbacker thought he could feel the mood in the rafts lighten. The tiny chunk of raw fish tasted cool and moist, one of the most delicious things he had ever eaten. Even Alex and Adamson, in all their misery, seemed to revive when the food hit their tongues. Best of all, the crew had proven they could use their own resourcefulness to survive. They had reached into the vast ocean and plucked food from it. With patience and a little in ingenuity, they had turned their prison into a pantry. There were, was an unlimited supply of fish in the sea, and it was theirs for the taking. The food had a noticeably different effect on Whitaker's mood. He enjoyed his two-course meal of turn and fish, but as soon as he finished, another craving took over. His mouth was pasty and dry. His head throbbed. It felt like the sun was baking every last drop of moisture out of him. The late afternoon air cooled and brought some relief, but when the sun finally dropped to the horizon... The colors in the sky tormented Whitaker. All he could think of was the expression, he drank in the sunset. 
The red would be strawberry, the yellow lemon, the purple grape, all he wanted, and he wanted it all with plenty of ice. The fact was that people have been known to survive two, even three months without food. Rarely did everyone la anyone last for two weeks without water.